Good morning again. Um, my name is Damir Naden. I head industrial DSM team at uh, Enbridge Gas, demand side management uh, group, which deals with uh, customers like yourselves in industrial field, trying to get you to use energy as efficiently as possible. That's our goal. That's our uh, mandate by Ontario Energy Board. And we've been doing this for a little while now. So um, topics that we'll cover today are not all that important. We'll get to that as, as we go. Uh, what I really wanted to uh, bring attention to, for those of you who have seen this, I apologize, we always have these graphs at the beginning, but for those uh, of you who are new to this, Enbridge has been offering this program for over 20 years now to industrial customers. We have also, we believe, we gained your trust uh, through the experience in working with you. Most of the materials on all these workshops have been developed with the help of programs um, where we cooperate with customers such as yourselves. So some uh, examples that you will see here are ba uh, mostly based on real life examples. They're not made up. They're not book, uh, book examples alone. Um, in, ad in addition to that, unique to the marketplace, what we have is an uh, auditing process in place, external and internal auditing process, which ensures that when we tell you that you're going to save a certain amount of energy, we stand behind that. And we're also fairly certain that you will get those savings. So, Sometimes those savings will differ from your expectations or from the expe expectations of the vendor who is selling you something. But we can assure you that we have went through the fairly rigorous procedure to ensure that you get the numbers that are as realistic as possible given the assumptions. Um, so what do we do is um, we split this in, in, in our uh, almost continuous improvement um, uh, matrix where we start with the knowledge development programs like this uh, workshops we send our industrial newsletter to those who subscribe to them um, once a quarter we send the information on new technologies and on new ideas that we have in the marketplace then we work with you people in white shirts around here are all what we call energy solution consultants they work with customers directly so they will come to your site they will talk to you they will find out what's what are your pain points and they will try to identify opportunities to save energy together with you. We don't have prescribed um, ideas. We don't come to the facility and say, this is what you should do without talking to you, because that's not really helpful to anybody. Each one of you has slightly different opportunities, a slightly different facility. And while technology might be the same, the implementation and assumptions that go into technology is completely different from site to site. So the job of our energy solution consultants is to come out there, talk to you, find out your specific <coughs> needs, and then tailor the uh, solution proposal to whatever you like. Sometimes assumptions that we work on, both yours and ours, need to be measured and quantified in some way. So we'll provide you with some ideas on how to measure it best, what to measure. Maybe you have already some information in the facility that we can approximate for energy use as well. Um, if you need meters, we will also provide financial incentive for metering uh, as well as uh, financial incentive for auditing to find some more information than what we can find uh, for you. Next step, of course, is now that we have some data, we identify opportunity. Now we have to do engineering analysis. Again, all those people in white shirts are engineers by profession. Um, they are all fairly good at their jobs. So they're very good at analyzing this opportunity. So. Uh, please feel free to use their knowledge, experience, and their uh, previous uh, projects as well uh, to your best advantage. When it comes down to finally finding um, something to implement, implementation itself is on to you. We do not implement anything. It's you, your vendors that you choose. We can suggest vendors if you want it, but we don't have anybody that needs to do a job for you to qualify for this program. So whoever works with you normally can execute the idea that we developed together. As long as we went through this process, we identified it together, we will provide in the end incentive, financial incentive to implement the project. But the implementation itself is, depends on your investment cycle, depends on your facility, we are there just to facilitate it. And then, of course, once we did that, the whole circle starts again because it's a continuous improvement process. We can develop new knowledge, find new opportunities, and on and on it goes until we find that there is no more opportunities. And I, I, I have not run into that yet with any of our customers. Each one of you 
has opportunity to reduce the energy use further. So what makes us sure that we know what we're talking about? So working with our customers, we have saved about 110 million cubic meters of natural gas. We have saved more than 20 million kilowatt hours of electricity and over 800,000 cubic meters of water in three year period alone. And we've been doing this for 20 years. And this is only on industrial. We also have programs for commercial and residential. This is only industrial. And of course, participating in this program save you money because you save energy. But it also, to, in today's world, it reduces the CO2 emissions. And this will become more important as, as we uh, go further into the future. You have to remember that less energy you use, the less emissions you create. Simple as that. So what we really want you to do is we're trying to help our customers from managing energy costs, which is very popular, and it's valid concern. Co energy costs money, so if you can reduce the cost of energy, that's great. But we want you to go into the managing energy because the reduction of actual energy that you consume is the most cost-effective way to get savings. If you can save 10% on the commodity cost, is less than if you can save 20% of your overall energy use. And of course, with the emissions, saving money on, on commodity side, on supply side, doesn't really change your emission formula, but saving energy does change your emissions. So that's our goal. That's what we want you to do. But what we're here today for is really waste heat. And when you think about waste heat, what comes to mind? Usually people think about waste heat, oh, you know, I have big stacks, I have very high heat furnaces, that's the waste heat, that's what we can recover. So what about the rest of us who work with robots, with food industry, with simple welding, what about the rest of us, right? Where, where will we find the sources of waste heat? And if we find it, where we will use it? And the third question is, okay, I found it, I know where I'm gonna use it, but is it worth recovering? Is it going to be economically feasible project? So some of the examples that we'll go through today, and we have a pretty packed day today with examples, uh, we'll try to answer these questions for you in, in industries other than very heavy industries, which are very, um, if you want, stereotypical waste heat recovery places. So you will see some of the opportunities to recover heat from a fairly um, stereotypical places, and then there will be a whole section of how to recover heat in a less um, expected ways. Uh, as we go through this, feel free to ask questions. There will be a slide after each section about questions and answers, but if you have any questions, feel free to ask them as we go along. So waste heat, how do we know we have it? Um, in 2008, US Department of Energy um, publishing, um, they published the information that one third of total energy consumed in the United States is consumed by industry. Canada is very similar. So one third of all our energy goes into industry. And 20 to 50%, depending on who you ask, um, I've seen the number of 34% of this energy was converted into waste heat. So when you look at the heating processes, and when you look at the what is waste heat representing? It's not just the loss of the, of the heat that goes up the stack. It's, it's not just that. What, what we have to look at is, what is it actual heat that we need to make something? What's the minimum requirement that goes into our product? That, what we, that's what we were going to call heat to load in our workshop today. What is it that we really need to make the product to quality specifications that we need to do every day? So that's driven by the product requirements. It usually um, comes back to either raising the temperature of certain amount of uh, product or evaporating uh, moisture of some sort. Those are usually the processes. It gets a little more complex when you bake something. It gets a little bit complex when you do some more um, uh, complex products. But this is basically what it comes down to. So when you look at heat to load, that's really the heat that you need. Everything else goes elsewhere. And if you look at the simple Sankey diagram, as Darren mentioned, in green is shown product heat, heat that goes into the load. On this side, we have gross input energy. 
So you can tell by the graph that only one portion of it goes into the load. The rest of it goes into stored energy, for example, if you have oven opening losses, material handling losses of different kinds, shell losses, and exhaust losses. And that will vary on type of equipment you have. You will have some, you will not have other ones. But big picture, it tells you that portion of the load, go, a portion of the energy that you pay for goes into the product that you really need. The rest goes elsewhere. And as the name implies, that elsewhere is waste because we call them losses. So that's all waste, opening losses, material handling losses, exhaust losses, shell losses. On boilers, we have blowdown losses. We have losses all over the place. And that represents a big part of our energy usage. Big part of the energy we pay for actually goes into loss, into waste. So if you look at it for convection oven, typical convection oven like, for example, in the paint lines, if you have 100% of energy going in, only 22% ends up in the heat to load. This is on average, but that's pretty close to what every one of you will have who has paint line. This is where the rest of it goes. You will notice that shell losses represent about 16%, material handling losses 17%, and exhaust losses whopping 44%. 44% of our energy just goes up the stack, and we paid for it. Boiler is a little bit better. Out of 100 per units going in, 76.5 units on average actually goes into the making steam. The rest goes either into the shell loss, blowdown losses, or exhaust losses, but it's still 20%. And there is far more boilers, there is ovens. So on aggregate, that represents huge losses in the industry. So either way you look at it, you're losing a good portion of the energy. Just wasted. So the question is, can we recover that somehow? And the reason to recover it is because if you look at it, your heating efficiency, big picture heating efficiency, if you say that heating efficiency is heat that goes into the load divided by the energy that you put into the process. Simple as that. And if you think of our diagrams, that input energy <coughs> goes on one side, heat to load is a small part of it, or it goes on the other side. If you can recover some of that energy, if you can put it back into the process, it would reduce your input energy. And what that would do is would increase your heating efficiency. So by recovering some of the waste heat by, back into the process, you're increasing the heating efficiency of your processes. Now the question becomes, which of those streams is worth recovering? We talked about shell losses, we talked about material handling losses exhaust losses, which one of those streams is worth recovering? So of course, I cannot give you an answer today that will fit all of you. That's why we have energy solution consultants. They can discuss specific applications with you. But what we can go, do is give you some ideas, give you a, a, a general state of, of, of waste heat, if you will. So if, if we go back to that um, energy, uh, US Department of Energy report, that said that one third of energy goes in industry and all that stuff. What they also said is that the biggest obstacles in recovery of that energy are twofold. Lack of viable end use and payback periods, which means people have heat sources, but they have nowhere to put it, or they think they have nowhere to put it, and the payback periods. Once they do decide to do it, it's too expensive, and the payback period goes over a typical year or two, whatever it is that your internal payback period criteria is. So what we'll try to do throughout today is showcase some of the projects that we worked on that actually overcome both of these. Some of them will apply to you, some of them won't, but what we're hoping to get at the end of the day that you will say, oh, I never thought about that part. That's the goal of today's exercise. So when we think about um, waste heat recovery, what are, what are the things that the, will determine the value of that recovery? What are the things that will make potential for recovery bigger or smaller? So, of course, source of waste heat, do you have it? If you have it, how much you have it and what's the quality of it? And by quality, I mean, what's the temperature of it? Is it 500 degrees F? Is it 50 degrees F? What's the temperature of that heat? And third part is, where are you going to put it? Or heat sink? 
All those three have to be considered to even have an idea of what the potential for recovery is. Because there's lots of people who will have lots of waste heat, but they will have nowhere to put it. And no matter how good you are, you will never make it economically feasible if you have no reason to use it. So on the other side of the potential, once you do the analysis either way, and you find your heat source, heat sinks, now you have to start looking how much does it cost to do that. So first cost, capital cost of equipment that you're going to put, including any utilities incentives have to be considered. Maintenance requirement, will this new piece of equipment cause me extra maintenance or not? Impact on the utilities, what, what savings will I get in natural gas, in electricity, or water? And what's the impact on my emissions? So all those things have to be considered on the other side of the equation. Now we have potential, we know what we're going to do, how much is it going to cost me? So having said that, going back to Darren's point, any heat stream has potential to be recovered, any one of them. So when you think about it, we talked about shell losses. You can insulate your hot surfaces or you can redistribute heated air. That's, both of those are valid ways of recovering heat through the, uh, that you lost through the shell of, of equipment. You have material handling losses, conveyor or carrier design. Do you need that big of a carrier for the parts that you're processing? Um, slightly offbeat is a condensate recovery. That's not necessarily material handling, but it's on, on the boiler side. Can you recover the condensate after, it's been, after the steam energy has been used? The more you can recover, the better of your process. Exhaust losses and blowdown losses. You can put a heat exchanger and exchange heat between two fluids to recover the heat of it. So every one of the streams through which we lose energy can be used as potential source of the waste heat recovery. So what we'll start with, we'll start with exhaust losses. And that's because that's a stereotypical heat recovery opportunity. When you think about heat recovery, you think about I'm going to put something on, the stack, on, on my exhaust stack, I'm going to recover heat. So we'll start with that. Um, it's a good reason why it's stereotypical, because large, large amounts of our energy are wasted throughout the stack. To remind ourselves, convection oven, 44% of the energy goes up the exhaust stack. Even on the well, well run boiler, 20% of the energy goes up the exhaust stack. So there is lots of potential to recover heat. Other, exam other good things about that is, it's available as long as the uh, process lasts. So as long as you run that boiler, that convection oven, you have that heat source available. You don't have to worry about uh, uh, volume. Ho uh, heat is often medium grade, um, and I'll call medium grade here anything above three, 400 degrees F, even though it's not technically uh, medium grade. Um, so st for steam boilers, usually it's 100 to 150 degrees F. I put here 115 over the steam temperature. That's what you get in the exhaust tank right after. And convection ovens, usually same as operating temperature. So those who operate convection oven, usually they're like 350, 375, 400. That's usually what you get in exhaust tank. So it's a pretty good source of heat. Volume of exhaust air is often consistent. As long as you run it at the same speed, oven will always run at the same consistency. Same volume will come out. So how do we quantify that energy? Energy in the exhaust stream for convection ovens, it's very simple. 1.08 times CFM or cubic feet per minute coming out of the exhaust times delta T. So operating temperature minus ambient temperature. That's the energy you have available. Usually not hard to figure out. Steam boilers, it's easier because you can determine by using just air uh, combustion efficiency chart. You can get an idea what percentage of energy you actually losing and what some um, uh, measure will save you. So let's start with the steam boilers first. Um, when you're using combustion efficiency chart, you read what your efficiency is, and we'll see an example later on. But for example, when you say that your combustion efficiency is 78.9%, that means that the stock loss is 21.1%. So it's inverse. So let's Think about how this works. On the, when you want to recover heat from the boiler, it's no big secret. You can either put feed water economizer, condensing economizer, or both. That's the 
typical way of recovering heat from the boilers. And for those of you who, are, um, who don't have feed water economizer, it's essentially heat exchanger. And it's uh, installed within the existing stock, preheats the feed water before it goes into the boiler to reduce the boiler energy. And it recovers sensible heat only. That's going to be important later on. So it's, that's effectively what feed water is. It's a heat exchanger you put into your stack that recovers some portion of the heat going up the stack. So this is essentially what the simple steam plant is. You have the boiler uh, that takes combustion air and natural gas to create a flame. You heat up the water inside the boiler to create process steam. Some part of that steam goes back into have, if you have deaerator, to clean up, to deaerate the mixture of makeup water condens condensate return that generates your boiler feed water, essentially. That's how usually simple steam plant works. So if you look at the, some of the typical examples for the small 200 horse uh, boiler, for example, you have 450 degrees F going up the stack. If you put feed water economizer on top of that and you feed boiler feed water through it from the DA, from the deaerator, instead of going directly into the boiler, goes into the feed water economizer at about, say, 230 degrees F, it'll come out at about 267 degrees F and your stack temperature will drop from 450 to 320. So essentially, instead of, wasting, uh, instead of pumping heat out of your stack at 450 degrees F, now you're pumping it out to 320 degrees F. And the difference in energy has been recovered through the feed water. So if you look at, as we said before, combustion chart, combustion efficiency chart, if you look at this particular example, Let's say we work in a 70 degrees F ambient, and we have excess oxygen of 5%. Just example, no particular reason for this. So if you look at the difference between temperature of the stack before the feed water economizer, 450 minus 70, that's 308 degrees F. You find it on the chart there, the far uh, right, 380, and you put 5 degrees F, 5% uh, oxygen, you will find that your Efficiency is 80.6%. So that was efficiency of the boiler before we installed feed water economizer. <coughs> now we're going to get 320 degrees F at the, after installation of feed water economizer, minus 70 because we work on the delta temperatures. As, as the chart implies, flue gas temperature minus combustion temperature, uh, combustion air temperature. So now we're talking 250 degrees F. 250 degrees F is between 240 and 260. So our efficiency will come out in between these two, 83.9. So installing in this particular case, feed water economizer saves you about 3-ish percent, 3%, 3 percent, 3 something percent. So that's how relatively simple it is to calculate the benefit of installing feed water economizer. So, on a feed water economizer project, actual project that we worked with with a customer, installation, design, finding out the potential cost about $23,000. Savings were about 102,000 cubic meters per year. Uh, and at cost of, we used here 25 cents per cubic meter, savings ended up being $25,000. In other words, before incentive, this project was sub one year payback. And then they got $11,000 incentive from us. So for essentially investment of uh, net uh, for $12,000-ish or so, they're saving every year 100,000 cubic meters for as long as that feed water economy is operational. So that's an example of a simple project, small investment, relatively good savings. But when you think about feed water economizer, when you go back to what Darren had mentioned, um, yes, feed water economizer is relatively inexpensive to implement. Um, heat source and heat sink are functionally related, so it's not difficult to, to combine them. Savings are around 3 to 5% of boiler consumption. <coughs> That's the best you can hope for. But the problem that I have with feed water economizer alone is we're leaving a lot of heat. When you go back and you think about it, you reduce it from 450 down to 320. 
so yes, you got some savings. It's all neatly packaged. It doesn't cost you very much. But you're leaving a fair bit of heat. 320 degrees F is still a lot of heat. And that's mainly because of design limitations of the feed water economizer. When you think about it, um, you have to leave the uh, feed water economizer with your stack gases at, at or above 300 degrees F, because otherwise, when you, your operation changes, you could cause condensation in the feed water economizer, which is not something you want to do. Um, so as a result, we typically use only boiler feed water as a heat sink. And that works for this particular application, but it also re it reduces the energy potential that you can recover. So this is where condensing economizer comes in. Condensing economizer, unlike the feed water economizer, is a heat exchanger that can be installed in stack as well, but it's typically installed off stack. So it's typically installed separately, and you have a little bit of a um, from the main stack, you draw the, the exhaust with a fan into the separate stack and before it goes uh, through the condensing economizer. So it's more expensive just from the perspective of how many pieces of equipment you have, but it's also stainless steel or some fancy material that will prevent corrosion. But what it does, because it allows condensation, it recovers latent heat as well. And now we're going to see how this works. So for example, if we already have uh, plan that we talked about earlier. We have feed water economizer. He, exhaust was leaving at 320 degrees F. So if you put um, some sort of um, uh, duct going off the main stack, you put it through the condensing economizer. And now you can use makeup water. Actually, you have to use makeup water. You cannot use feed water here because feed water would be too hot for the condensing economizer to work. You have to put something cold through the condensing economizer to condense the exhaust. So that means that water, that, that source that uh, you put through the condensing economizer has to be below condensation temperature, which is 130 -ish degrees F. And that changes the formula. That means that I am not depending just on my boiler feed water to, to give me that heat sink. I can use, if I have lots of process water, I can use that condensing economizer to preheat all my process water. That's a huge benefit to people who are in those industries. And I will give you an example of one. This is a condensing economizer project that we've done where we have not used neither feed water economizer nor boiler makeup water. What we have done instead, because it was installation on an old boiler, we said, you know what, don't, bo don't bother installing two pieces of equipment, install one installed the condensing economizer, put the process water where they had lots of requirements. They ran 32 GPM, I believe, or so, at 60 degrees F through that. And they ran that 8,000 hours a year. So they have the huge heat sink. They spent $276,000 installing this, but they have saved, look at the savings, 660,000 cubic meters of natural gas. They also saved electricity because of the way they were using the heat sink and how their system worked, what they could pull out. They actually replaced, with the condensing economizer, they replaced direct contact water heater. They replaced a whole bunch of heat exchangers and pumps in their system. And their savings were about $161,000, $162,000. So they had 1.7 year payback on $276,000 project. Again, before the incentive. When they worked with us, we actually gave them additional $67,000 incentive, so their payback went down to almost one, one, 1 1.2 years. So this is where the condensing economizer really makes a difference when you think about it. It is more expensive because it has to be corrosion resistant, but it can be used with multiple boilers. So for example, if you have two or three boilers, you can have only one condensing economizer and then you feed all three stacks into it. So if you change your boiler load, it doesn't affect your condensing economizer output. It can be used not only for makeup water. It's, you can use any process water. And the savings are typically 10% of energy consumption on their own. If you use it only a condensing economizer without the feed water economizer, then you can get up to 15% or so savings, which is what the other customer have had.
So to wrap up this particular section for boiler loss uh, recovery, please give us a call. We'll come out. We'll do the testing of the boiler stack for you. Uh, we'll determine how much excess oxygen you have, what the temperature is, what the volumes are. We will help you determine that. If we can't do that, we'll uh, provide some financial incentive towards the third party that will do that for you. Workbook example. So this is a very first example in your workbook. We'll do a very quick analysis. We'll have a boiler that has a condensing economizer on top of it. We will assume that the flue gas energy coming out of the boiler is 1.65 million BTUs per hour. We will also say that condensing economizer recovers 98% of available heat for the sake of the example. We will use process water, 30 GPM of process water going in at 50 degrees F into the condensing economizer. And we want process water out at 170 degrees F because that's what our process requires. So that's the basic um, assumptions of this problem. We also, if you look at your example, you will have a table with inputs already formulated for you. So available heat is 1.65 million. 98% of that is recoverable. We have 30 GPM of water flow. And we have inlet temperature of 50 and desired temperature of 170 degrees F coming out. Formulas that we'll use are also in your example. We will say that the, water, uh, that the energy required is the mass of the process water times delta T, delta T being desired temperature of the water minus the process water coming in, so 170 minus 50. And the mass of process water is volume of uh, water in GPMs times 500. That's close enough for our example to give us pounds per hour. And this is the formula for economizer. So if you work through that example, let's see what answers you get. So this example provided us a pretty good, gave us a pretty good idea of 30 gallons of water. That's 15,000 pounds per hour of water that we heated from 50 to 158 degrees F just with the exhaust from your boiler. So that concludes the boiler exhaust recovery. But when we go back, we, we talk about recovery of exhaust from both convection ovens and the steam boilers. So steam boilers we just de dealt with. Let's think about convection ovens for a second. Now, lots of us have convection ovens in one way or the other. Um, we, we base these examples on, for example, a paint dry curing oven. But it can be applied to many, many different ovens. So when you think about oven stack loss recovery on the convection ovens, what, what do you think about you, you go back to that graph that I showed you that 44% of the energy put into the oven was actually lost in the exhaust. That's an average. Most, we, we have worked, uh, we had a pretty good campaign a couple of years ago, I believe, uh, where we um, had a, a workshop just like this one, but just on process heating. And we dealt with the process oven itself. We have found through uh, working with customers who then applied later on for the program and we worked with them on reducing that oven energy usage, we found that most of them actually had 60% of the energy going up the stack. 60% of your input energy went up the stack of your ovens. That's a huge amount of energy. Most effective way to deal with that is to reduce it if you can. And the reason I'm saying this is because, for, for example, especially in the paint lines, in, in the old times, we all used different solvents. We had the reasons why our exhaust had to be as high as possible. One of the things that TSSA demands when you install a convection oven for the paint line is that you have to exhaust about four times the volume of the oven before you can light up the burner. So manufacturers in those times they put a big exhaust fence onto the oven so that your purge time wouldn't be as long. Nobody wants to wait three hours to just restart the oven. So you want to restart the oven in 10, 15 minutes, you're going to put a large exhaust. As well, at that time, VFDs were very expensive. So nobody put VFD. So whatever exhaust fan you had for purging, you had it all the time. So what this means is that you are exhausting a lot of air after the purge when you don't really need it. And then the paint, uh, uh, paint itself has changed. We have no solvents these days. 
So we really need very little air going out of the oven. So the first step should always be to try to reduce that amount of exhaust. Put VFD that works in one way when the purge is on, and then reduce the exhaust to whatever your process requirements are. That's the step number one. There's no point in, in recovering heat if you don't need to generate it in the first place. But then whatever you have left, and there will be plenty left, then try to recover the heat off of that. <coughs> we have seen this over and over, finding a proper heat sink to make project both economically feasible and, um, and that it uh, pays back. So to do that, you need a heat sink. As Darren has mentioned, for more complex uh, processes where you have a multiple sources of heat, multiple heat sinks, pinch analysis is one way of doing it. If you have only one oven and you only have one way of recovering that heat, let's find out what it is. However you get to it, we need to find out where your heat will be used for, uh, in. And unlike in the feed water implementation, Analyzing savings is more complex because you can't just stick a probe into your exhaust of the convection oven because you're not going to get correct readings to do the combustion chart. So analysis that you do, and if you, do any, if you need any help, please feel free to ask any of our energy solution consultants to help you with this. Any analysis should answer the following questions. How much heat do you have available in your oven? So volume of exhaust. It's typically found that if you, if you have some serious uh, oven, you will probably have a certificate of air documentation. It should be in it because you, you're uh, effectively polluting and therefore you're on, on the radar for the Minister of Environment. You have that. Or in temperature, it can be closely estimated from the oven set point. That's good enough for start. If you don't have C of A, but you have exhaust, for example, fan uh, specifications. Let's start with that. If the fan specification says 2000 CFM, it's probably pretty, pretty close what you have because those fans are TSSA approved, so they have to perform the way it says on the nameplate. What is going to be your heat sink? Where will you use it? Is it appropriate for the temperature? There's, you can't recover heat if, if you're uh, exhausting at 350 degrees F. You cannot recover it somewhere where it needs 500 degrees F. It's just not possible, so you have to match the two. Um, Will the heat sink and heat source operate at the same time? Going back to that question that Jim had, do you want to uh, use your heat source to heat your building? You could do that, but then half of the year that heat is not going to be recovered, really. Uh, will the volume of, sink, uh, of, of uh, heat sink vary considerably? So if you want to put some sort of process water, is that process water going to vary considerably? Will it be like 30 GPM today and 10 GPM tomorrow and 50 GPM the day after, what is going to be? And also, don't forget to think about, will that heat sink actually cool your exhaust below, below the dew point? That's very important. You don't want to do that on, as an error because you will be without a stack very, very shortly. What's in your exhaust? Does, does it contain some particles that can accumulate inside the heat exchanger? Your vendor that you're asking for a quote will usually ask you that. Um, if they are on the hook to warranty your heat exchanger, they will want to know what you're putting through that heat exchanger. Again, sometimes a certificate of air can help you. If you read through it, you usually, your company usually says what is it that they're putting through the exhaust. If not, there are tests that can be done for that. So once you answer those questions and you have a pretty clear idea, and our ESCs can help you with that. Now it's time to get the vendor in and ask them the next series of questions. What's the first cost? What's the effectiveness? To, so to your question earlier, to ensure that effectiveness of the heat exchanger is guaranteed by somebody. And what are the maintenance requirements? Will this, um, will, is this something that is going to be cleaned on a yearly basis? Is this something that's maintenance-free? What is it? Those things need to be answered before you actually go into the project. We can't, of course, given all the, all the different variations and, and differences in ovens and equipment that all of you have, we can't give you a, a set of solutions right here, right now. But what we can do is work with you to find the solution that works for you. So, however, in, in all our workings with the customers, we found two different 
ways of recovering heat. So one is through the seasonal load. So you usually have some glycol loop to preheat the makeup air or process load, for example, preheating the oven air. And as we talked about, because of the payback criteria, because of the, um, you can recover more of the heat more often, more effectively in the, back in the process, we prefer the option number two as our first choice, if we can. Also, don't forget your consumption levels. Don't forget when, you, when you're going to choose, oops, when you're going to choose your um, as heat sink, is your seasonal, is your load consumption over three years look like this, where you see the red portions are your seasonal load, blue portions are your process load? Is this your profile? Or is your profile looking like this, where your consumption is pretty steady throughout the year? Which one is it? Because in this case, it makes absolute sense to put it back into the process because you have very little seasonal load to begin with. And that's not always. That's not every month. If your profile looked like this, now you might have a good case, even though you're not going to recover it all the time. Heat sink is large enough that it might make sense to actually preheat the makeup air. It depends. That's why it's important to know your situation. So what we'll see now is an example of the heat recovery that was done just recently, I think, Paul, a couple of years ago. Yeah. Uh, right there, you see the stack coming out of the paint line dry curing oven. That went 4,000 CFM of oven exhaust went up that stack before the implementation of this project. What customer has done is they diverted 4,000 CFM through the air-to-air -air heat exchanger. And so unlike the uh, economizers on the boilers, this is air-to-air -air heat exchanger usually. Um, so we exhaust through that uh, heat exchanger rather than going up the stack. On the other side of the heat exchanger, we take outside air and preheat it before it being introduced into the oven itself. So of course they had these VFDs right there that made sure that both exhaust and the intake were balanced so they wouldn't disturb the uh, oven balance. And that, that was one way of recovering the heat for them. So that was actual project. And Paul was um, very involved in that. So this is what they actually achieved. For about $30,000 of design and install, correct Paul? They saved about 100,000 cubic meters of natural gas. Uh, it cost them about $4,000 in electricity. Those are not savings. Those are actually negative. Um, so for the total, $24,000 savings. So they got 1.25 year payback period, even with additional electricity costs. And of course, they got half of the cost from us. So we're talking about this uh, exhaust stack recovery in these last two examples. But that's not the only places where you can use heat exchanger to extract some of the heat. So before we go into the little more different examples of the waste heat recovery, I would like to bring two more examples of heat exchanger heat recovery in which we actually use heat exchanger to recover some of the heat. First one is, of course, boiler blowdown, which is fairly uh, familiar to most of you. Um, as you know, boiler blowdown is releasing um, boiler <coughs> water from the, from the boiler itself at near steam temperatures, so it's very hot. Uh, it's required. You have to have it, but it still represents a significant loss, relatively speaking, for the boilers. It can be usually 1 to 3 percent, but some people have it much higher depending on how good their boiler operation is. What, what makes it even worse is that sometimes people will release the blowdown straight down into the uh, drain, which um, makes it too hot for the sewage system. So what they have to do is they have to add cold water to mix the two. So not only are you using the energy from the, losing the energy from the boiler, you're also losing the fresh water that you have to mix it with to dilute the temperature. 
Step one, reduce blowdown rates that get your boiler operation in order. That's always first step. And quantify how much you have. Uh, again, our ESCs can help you, but that's very important to know how much you have to do the economic analysis of the recovery. So if you look at the blowdown stream, it goes usually through some sort of blowdown tank. Flash steam is lost through the vent, as Darren has mentioned. And the rest potentially gets mixed with the cold water, goes down the drain. That's usually how most smaller operations work. So now if you replace that with a heat exchanger and put the, what goes out of the blowdown tank through the heat exchanger before it goes down into the uh, drainage, you don't have to mix it with the cold water because now it's going to cool on its own because you're going to put something like a makeup water, some other source of uh, heat sink on the other side of the heat exchanger. To be even better, you can put the flash tank and then recover the flash steam rather than letting it vent up the uh, roof. You can actually put it back into the DA or into your receiver of some sort to make it really, uh, to re reduce your uh, waste uh, to as little as possible. So what people actually do is you can buy this as a pre-packaged solution, if you will. It comes on a little skid from different companies. Um, and all you have to do is hook up your um, sources of heat to it. So it's a very simple way to recover roughly 1% to 3% of your boiler consumption for not much money. Um, but it's not just combustion equipment alone. You have to remember that there's other source of heat inside your facility. It's not just combustion equipment. So cooling loops, if you have any sort of cooling loop, what do you do with the cooling loop? In the end, it all goes up to the cooling tower where it evaporates, cools down, and then you use the process heat again. So all of those are very good sources of waste heat. Essentially, any cooling loop can be used to recover heat from. In this particular example, we had a water-cooled air compressor. Um, that took ambient air, compressed it, of course, that had water from the cooling tower going to its heat exchanger to cool it down. What we did is before it went back into the cooling loop, we actually put heat exchanger on it. Then it went into the cooling tower or to the line that went into the cooling tower. And on the other side, we actually used it to preheat the process water. And what we actually ended up doing is we ended up having uh, cool it down. So temperature going out of the compressor was 100 degrees F. We managed to get it down to 90 degrees F. And we cooled 30 GPM. Uh, we heated 30 GPM of water from 50 to 90 degrees F. So in this particular case, with those numbers, they had a heat exchanger installed, $21,000. These are the savings. 229,000 cubic meters of natural gas was saved. There was a reduction of the load on the cooling tower, which we didn't take into account. That was too complex for us to calculate at that point, and the customer was not interested because the payback, just based on gas, was below six months. And the cost of this implementation was very low. They had a compressor very close to their cooling loop that went right next to the process water loop, so their, their piping was very neat, very short, which is reflected in the cost of it. But even so, less than half a year payback for this kind of implementation. So this time around, in this example, we will deal with the recovery from the oven exhaust, just like that example that we talked about previously. In this case, we will recover 3,000 CFM of um, exhaust, and we'll assume that it leaves the oven at 350 degrees F. We'll put it through the air-to-air -air heat exchanger. Capacity of it is 600,000 BTUs. In this case, capacity means this is how much it can actually recover on the other side. Includes effectiveness of the heat exchanger. So we will put 3,000 SCFM at 350 of oven exhaust through one side of it. It will come out on the other side as exhaust. On the, on the opposite side of the heat exchanger, 3,000 SCFM of the outdoor air of average temperature 46.9 will go into the exchanger and it will go into the oven inlet at some temperature that we have to determine. So the idea is 
let's figure out what's the temperature of the oven inlet that we can get out of this. So again, these are the inputs that you have in your workbook. These are the formulas that we're going to use for the oven inlet, natural gas capacity um, for that uh, heat exchanger capacity. At heating value of 35,739 is assumed. These is, this is how you're going to calculate the savings. So we should have gotten temperature of about 232 degrees F. And by doing that, we saved 150,000 cubic meters of natural gas in this particular case. So again, a very simple example, very simple implementation, lots of savings. We talked about, we talked about exhausts a lot, so everything we recovered here was either blowdown heat or exhaust. But what about the other sources of waste heat? What about, uh, what about recovering waste heat from other streams that we talked about originally, if you'll recall. We had exhaust stream, we had uh, material handling losses, we had shell losses, we had all sorts of losses. So how to recover heat from that? So if you'll remember, shell losses, a couple of ways of recovering that heat was through insulation of the hot surfaces or distribution of the heated air. And we will work through those examples now. Usually people don't think of insulation as a recovery of the waste heat. But when you really think about the basic principles, if you have energy required of the end of this, of the process, if you have a heat exchanger on one side and you need to supply it with energy, let's say steam, through some sort of pipe, and if you put that steam through it and not insulate it, you will get energy losses. It'll be just like shell losses. It'll be heat that's lost through the convection of air around that hot pipe. And as a result, your energy that you generate will have to be higher than the energy that's required in your process. And if you go back, that's your, it affects your heating efficiency. And it also requires you to have a larger generation of steam. So that's the basic principle of how it works. But if you put insulation around it, you will effectively reduce the energy losses. And if you reduce the energy losses, you will need a smaller generator of steam. You will increase your heating efficiency, which goes back to the waste heat recovery. It's the same principle. If you, recover, if you think of this heat that was radiating out of the pipe, convection, um, losing it through the convection of the air by the pipe, it's now recovered. So we recovered that waste heat. That's essentially what it is. Um, if you recover it before the intended point of use, you increase the heating efficiency of your process. Simple as that. So the insulation of the hot surfaces is equivalent of waste heat recovery. And it can be considered one form of waste heat recovery. So, for example, we had a customer that Louise was working on, correct? Louise, this is your project. We had uh, uh, extensive piping throughout the facility with steam. Most of it was already insulated, but there's a few things that they didn't insulate. Three valves, flanges, some pipe sections, and the rectangular section, I believe this was an economizer somewhere. So that was not insulated. Once they put insulation on that, for the total cost of about thirteen, fourteen thousand dollars $14,000, they actually saved 50,000 cubic meters in gas. So again, one year, 1.1 year payback for a project for an investment of thirteen, fourteen thousand dollars $14,000. They recovered 50,000 cubic meters of natural gas. Very simple way of recovering, if you will, wasted heat. Incentive was half of the project cost, $6,000. So it's simple, it's effective. There's very little risk unless you put insulation on something you shouldn't be putting it in and then rots out. So you have to be careful with that. But that's a very odd on the fringe type case. In almost all cases, you can insulate heat uh, piping, valves, flanges. Other thing that we have to also touch upon is some people 
have told me before that, oh, I don't want to insulate it because it's going to make my place colder. That's OK if that's how your place works. However, things that you have to re remind yourself is, is your steam boiler the best, more e most efficient way to heat the space with? And is the heat that is generated or lost through those pipes in the spot where you need it? Lots of times, these pipes will be near the roof because they don't want them close to it where anybody can touch it. So they'll be near the roof. So the heat that you generate will actually just be going up the roof rather than heating the space. Almost in all cases, there is a better, more efficient way of heating your space. Just like you wouldn't use incandescent bulb just so you can continue on heating your home. You will still switch to something more efficient, even though you will have to pay in heating. Um, the other thing is, so that's pretty self-explanatory. Everybody can grasp the hot pipe insulation. People can get their head around this. The other thing is that people usually don't think as a sources of waste heat when we talk waste heat in, in our workshops is machines that generate heat as you walk by. You have to remember, you can always find sources of waste heat by walking through your facility, or if you don't walk, just look at what people are wearing. If the operators on one side of your facility wear shorts and short sleeves all year long, while the guy next in the shipping door is freezing, that's your source of the waste heat right there, somewhere in that area. Usually, process ovens, shell losses out of the process ovens. So ovens are not just exhausting losses out, they also radiate losses out. Air compressors, cool air, air cooled comp air compressors in this case. Injection molding, extrusion machines. Not typically sources of heat that we think of as waste heat. But they are. They're very wasteful and they have a lot of heat to recover. So essentially any source of convection heat is a good place to start recovering that heat for one way or for one reason or another. This is another question that I often get asked. Well, you know, I have this source of waste heat here. Why do I need to do anything with it? Because it just it distributes naturally. That would be the case unless you have a whole bunch of exhaust right on top of it. And what happens in 90% of the cases in the summertime, because you have to remember, those sources of heat are usually related to the process. So in the summertime, they generate just as much heat as they do in the wintertime. In the summertime, people don't usually like to be near those. So easiest way to deal with that is to put a bunch of exhausts up on top of the roof above those areas and draw large amounts of air out. That deals with the heat there. But nobody goes in the winter time and turns those exhausts off. So that natural heat that's generated by these shell losses actually doesn't get redistributed in your place. It just gets shoved up the roof very quickly. As a matter of fact, you will find that 75 to 85% of the industrial facilities in our service area have large negative air. And what that means is they exhaust far more air than actually they bring in the makeup air because of the reasons like such, such as these. So what we really need is some mechanical means to move the heat from where it's generated to where it's needed. And it can be done in a variety of ways. Essentially, this is what you're trying to do. You're trying to get the heat from somewhere around the oven or some other source, put it near the shipping area where it's usually cold because doors keep open and closed. So if you have first gone and reduced your negative air as much as you could, that the next step is redistributing this. The next, cu next couple of examples will deal with exactly those things, uh, situations. So for example, we had a customer blow molding machinery. It's an ideal source of heated air. Because what it does is, is if anybody has been in the plastics processing place, you will find that the, these massive pieces of steel essentially heated by electrical heat usually, or steam heat for some, will be heated to 500-ish degrees F, so they can melt the plastic. Plastic is molten, gets molded into some sort of product shape that you want. So all of that heat that's generated sits there right above those machines, usually exhausted up the roof. 
So in this case, we had uncomfortable blow molding area because they had too much heat. So everybody was hot, so they put a bunch of exhaust up on top of them. And then they had warehousing area just behind the wall. So if, if you look at this wall just behind in the other room, they would have a warehousing area that was fairly cold. And they used natural gas for heating that area. So George worked with them on that example. And what they, this is the situation. We had warehousing area, air infiltration, just normal air infiltration, and the space was needed to be heated by those space heaters. Behind the wall, we had a whole bunch of blow molding machines. Air was taken out at 18,100 CFM at about 42 degrees Celsius out of the air, out of the space above the blow molding machines. So this actual 42 degrees Celsius was measured, George, right on the roof, right at the exit of the exhaust, correct? Right. So that's the amount of heat that was actually lost. So first thing that we did is they installed temperature-driven dampers on these exhausts. So they would divert some of the air instead of exhausting. Air would stay inside the facility. And then to prevent killing people here, they installed a whole bunch, I believe, um, 14 or so fans and created holes in the walls where those fans are. So they would take the heat from one room into the another room. That would reduce the air infiltration because now you added air into the space. And it would require, uh, reduce the need for heated uh, space heating in that area. So in their case, this was a fairly expensive project because they, they had 14 fans. And they have a fairly sophisticated um, uh, control system for those units. Even with that, that was 2.7 year payback for those kind of projects. And this is the, the highest, uh, the longest payback that I have seen on these kind of projects. We will work through the example later on where you will see that the payback was within a year for very similar application. But the thing to remember here is you take the heat that you already have, you move it somewhere where you need it, rather than heat it with a natural gas or any other source. And you will do two things. You will improve your balance in the building. So you will not move that coal there from the shipping area right across the facility to the warmest area in the facility and then dump everything up the roof. You will re reduce that. And you will also make the areas are where they're typically cold nowadays, you will make them more comfortable. So let's work through the example of one more last workbook example. This was based on another one of our customers' projects. Very similar to what we just talked about. They had outdoor air coming in, and they had source of heat in the facility. Also plastic processing. It was not blow molding, but it was extrusion. They, in this case, they had 88,000 SCFM going up the roof. 88,000. And it was measured that that exhaust was at about 82 degrees F, leaving the exhaust fan. Indoor temperature was 68 degrees F at the time, maintained by the whole bunch of space heating units around the perimeter of the building. So first thing that we do is we reduce the exhaust. They took the socks that look like ducts, like a textile ducts. They put fans on top of them, and they recovered 60,000 CFM. They moved 60,000 CFM of air from this warm area into their shipping area across the building. And I believe those were 35, 40 feet long, something like that, each. That reduced the infiltration of the air. So these are the inputs into our workbook example. We have 88,000 uh, CFM of the exhaust, leaving at 82 degrees F. We're recovering 60,000 of those for 6,278 heating hours. So one thing also to remember in this is if you have never done this before, if you look at the consumption of the building, for example, if you look at the uh, three-year average month by month, what this facility has used, for example, and if we say that in this example, we have a facility that uses 60,000 cubic meters of natural gas in January, and so on, and you did it for a whole month. 
you build a three-year average of monthly consumption for the building. If you now take a line that essentially rides on top of these summer months, anything below that line is considered your base load. So that doesn't change with your seasonality. No matter how hot it is outside, you will still use that. So your seasonal load, the load that goes into heating the building, is above. And in this particular case, if you take all these little things, you get about 266,000 cubic meters a year goes into heating. So if we do the calculations right through, what you will find out that actual savings are only as big as your consumption. And this is very important thing to remember when somebody is selling you any sort of efficiency thing. That they check what you actually use. Because calculation, based on calculation, what were the savings? 300 and, so 391,000 cubic meters was actually saved based on calculations, based on formulas. But you're only using 266,000. So you cannot save more than that. The only way you can save that, for real, is if your facility was before this implementation, not at 68 degrees, but say 55 degrees. And for you to actually get to 68, you would have to add additional heat before this heat recovery. That's the only way you can recover that full 391,000. In this case, we already said facility was 68 degrees F, so there was no need to add heat to it. So your savings are equal to your seasonal load. Usually when we do this kind of um, example, we tell the customers this is what you can do. Usually customers say, I don't have any blow molding machinery, sorry. OK, that's true. You don't have blow molding. But do you have anything else that generates that heat? Do you have air compressors? Do you have air-cooled air compressors? Almost all of us have air compressors. Most of it is air-cooled. And air compressors are one of the least efficient pieces of equipment you will ever purchase, ever. 80 to 93% of the energy that you put into the air compressor is actually converted into waste heat. And when I started my career, I started in, in, a, in a smaller facility. I was a design engineer. So we had a machine shop. When you would go out, what were they using to clean the shop with? Compressed air. And I bet you that some of you have seen that today in your facilities. This is the most expensive way to clean the facility. <laughs> Probably cheaper to pay somebody to come and clean it for you. Exactly. To make things worse, because air compressors like to have cold intake air to be most efficient, they're usually placed in a separate room somewhere off to the side. They're loud and they're most efficient when they get direct access to outdoor air. So they're usually segregated from the uh, rest of the building. And what do you have? You usually have on the top of the compressors, you have some hood that exhausts air right out, the build, out of the building. So 90% of your electricity gets converted to waste heat that then gets dumped out of the building. And you're paying for natural gas to heat the rest of the building. So what you could do, you could create a ducting that will divert exhausted air on top of the compressor, warm air, and put it into the building. This is one of the probably best um, values for the dollar in heat recovery you can get if this applies to you, if you don't already do it. You can uh, be fancy. You can put the uh, damper onto this uh, ducting. You can say if the temperature, outdoor temperature is such and such, turn on the fan this way or that way. You can do any number of things. You could put socks and the fan that will then take this air farther down into the facility, whatever you want. But this is one of the best ways to recover the heat. First, optimize the equipment you have. Don't recover heat just because it's there. Try to first figure out, do you need to use that much energy to generate that heat? Always first thing, reduce. That's the biggest impact. 
because yes, we've seen many people who, when, once they actually look how their compressors are working, especially the weird loops that we have from like previous generations, you can get rid of three quarters of your compressors easily. So, but if you do have any sort of uh, inkling of how to use your heat from the compressor on our portal at this address, and you can get that from when you go on our portal, we have a calculator for the air compressor heat recovery, for condenser economizer recovery, feed water recovery, all sorts of calculators that can help you, give you a ballpark. They're not very accurate. I wouldn't base my business case on it. That's why we have uh, energy solution consultants to help you with it. But as a first cut, just to see whether it even makes sense, they're a great uh, help to you. Now, when we talk about air redistribution, the things that always come up is the, is this safe? What's the quality of the air? All, all the questions that people usually ask because they see this hot air being blown through the facility, is that the best thing to do? So, should we maybe insulate the ovens before we blow the air around? Well, yeah, we could, but that's not always possible. It's not always the best idea just to add insulation on top of some other insulation unless you know what you're doing, especially in the ovens. Um, sometimes it's not possible, sometimes it's not desirable to do that. And the second one is air quality. Will my air quality be affected? Air, indoor air quality tests are relatively inexpensive for a medium-sized facility. I think they come to five to $7,000. We would cover half of that cost if that's the problem that you're seeing in implementing the energy, energy efficiency initiative. So that should not be a stumbling block. And you can very quickly find out whether what you're trying to redistribute has any impact on, on air quality or not. In the end, what it comes down to is that redistributing this air is relatively inexpensive. It's simple and it makes not only savings in natural gas, potential electricity, but it also it increases the comfort. This is almost in all cases that we had that. And as I said, you have an actual um, case study in, in your packages as well, where one of the customers has implemented this. So in summary, two ways to recover heat. One is exhaust stack heat recovery. So essentially you're paying money to power a piece of equipment, while at the same time, you're wasting portion of that cost up the stack. If you have another piece of equipment somewhere nearby in the same facility, you're doing the same thing. You're paying all sorts of money just to put a portion, good portion of that money, as we talked about, let's, let's call it 30% of it, up the stack. So why wouldn't you take some of the stack heat, put it into some sort of heat exchanger, put it into the other uh, equipment, reduce the gas on that equipment, so reduce the cost of operating that secondary piece of equipment while you're reducing emissions and the cost of operating first piece of equipment. So either way, you're increasing the efficiency of your process and you're lowering the cost of your production. The other way to look at it is if you have some electricity users and you have makeup air unit, let's say. Makeup air unit is fairly expensive to run you put dollars to run it to heat outdoor air to get it to the indoor air temperatures. In the meantime, of course, electricity is more expensive, so there's more of it here. You pay a lot in electricity cost to generate a lot of waste heat from the air compressors for uh, blown molding machines, equipment like that. Why wouldn't you take that heat, put it through some sort of heat exchanger to preheat a glycol loop, for example, or to just redistribute it around the facility Reducing the, need, reducing the need for the makeup air in the first place. So all of those are ways to reduce your costs, reduce your natural gas usage, reduce your electricity usage while maintaining the shop comfort. So all those examples, if you can think of anywhere where you can fit in and you say, oh, I think that I have some warm spot in my facility. Let me see if that makes sense to recover. Come talk to us.
we will for free do analysis of it. We will do as much as we can to get you to the point to understand, is this economically feasible or not? And then you can decide whether you want to do it or not. That's up to you. But at least you will have an idea. Is this worth my while? So we will I'm, I'm in strongly encouraging you to get us involved to see, is there anything that we can work with you on that? The other thing is, we all know you're busy. Um, when I was in, 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 in my jobs, I never used to worry about energy, to be honest. Uh, we had a bunch of um, electrical panels all over the place. And because we were a dirty environment, we took out the air conditioning from those panels because we didn't want to clean them and deal with the filters. We just put one of those house air conditioning units on top of the roof and then distribute cold air into each electrical panel. So we would have, for each uh, unit, we had three or four panels cooled. We never worried about how much that costs. That wasn't our problem. But we are now changing. The environment is changing. The culture is changing. So we still understand that this is probably not for most of you at the top of your mind. Energy is not what you think about first. It's production, it's quality, it's safety, all those things. But let's put it this way. We had six examples today. Those were real world examples, actual project. Average cost out of those six was $77,000. Average annual savings discounted by 15%, but either you don't invest in maintenance and you get degradation of the savings over the years, or you invest in maintenance and you lose 15% in increased maintenance. Worst case scenario, let's say. So average savings reduced by 15%. Internal rate of return, 134%. Only if you use this for five years. There is nothing else that gives you this IRR these days. Nothing. And then average incentive was $21,000 to get over that hump of the first year cash flow problems. I mean, when you look at it that way, on average, there is no better investment for your facility than to invest in these kind of projects. And if you look at it that way, if you present it in this format to your accountants, I guarantee you that they will at least give you a serious look. Forget BTUs, forget being good to the environment. Look at that. Like people have talked about IRR being good at 30%, being fantastic. And this is only for five years. Henry Ford said once something similar. He said that uh, if, you, if you needed a machine and you didn't invest in buying it in the past, you will find that you have paid for that machine and you didn't have it in the end anyways. So if you paraphrase that and you say that if you don't invest in reducing your wasted energy today, you will ultimately find that you invested that money, you paid for it, but you will still be wasting the same amount of energy. And that's very important. That's what I would like, you, uh, like to leave you with, that thought. Eventually, company will have to pay that amount of money and they will still be using more money in their cost for energy than they need to be. So if you need us to help you with any case, if you need us to help you with identifying opportunities, if you need us to help you building a business case, if you need us to figure out the BTUs, or if you need us to go in front of your management with you and say, hey, this is how we view it, we're willing to do all of those things for you. So that's all for today. If you have any questions, I'm open to questions. If you have any questions for our ESCs, they're here. Then that's all. We're going to let you go back to your day jobs. Thank you very much.